Yeah, so I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about some recent work that I've been doing looking at cylinder packings um, and making some related um, tensegrity structures that are um, three periodics, so periodic in three directions of space, um, and some um, investigating that we've been doing in this in this direction. Um, so I hope that some of the some of the things are familiar and um, yeah, maybe you like the structure. So let's get started. So I'm going to start um, by talking about cylinder packings. Um, so essentially, this is just the idea. It's, I guess, a, a, an extension of sphere packings um, is to look at how you can pack infinite cylinders in space. So infinite straight cylinders um, in, in a periodic setting in this case. Um, so yeah, there's some really nice work um, that's been going on for quite a while now. Um, I guess um, here's a really old paper that's really nice from Anderson and O'Keefe in 1977, talking about this particular packing here. Um, and there's um, a lot of um, very nice work going on talking about cubic rod packings in general. So I guess the, the simplest way to pack cylinders would just be parallel, parallel cylinders in space. And so their cross section would just be circle packing, so 2D circle packings. Um, but there's a really nice set of structures that are cubic. Um, so they have cubic symmetry, which means that if you look at if you look at them from each of the directions of the of the cube, so along the x or the y or the z direction, um, they look essentially the same. Um, so they're kind of isotropic um, in the way that they behave mechanically as well. Um, so yeah, these have been um, studied in a in quite a nice way, um, in particular in, in chemistry, so in structural chemistry, where there's quite a few um, chemical frameworks um, that are very neatly described by rods of strongly bonded atoms. So in particular, the garnet structure um, is one that was described in this paper here in 1977, um, was well known for a long time, um, um, but the, the structure wasn't really simply described until they could describe it by this rod packing here, where these rods are, are representing some rods of particular um, atoms that are bonded in a particular way. And more recently, um, these kind of rod packings are um, used in, in metal organic frameworks and um, some nice synthetic chemistry. Um, so um, what I'm gonna get to eventually today is um, moving from a rod packing like this to um, a tensegrity structure like this. So this is my three periodic tensegrity structure. Um, so that's what I'm gonna to get to eventually, um, but I'm gonna take a rather long path there um, just to um, show you a little bit the path that I've taken to get towards these structures. And this isn't just um, for historical purposes, it gives you a bit of a context of the type of geometries that I'm looking at um, and why it's then interesting to look at them um, as tensegrity structures. Um, so I'm going to start with um, looking at triply periodic minimal surfaces of genus three. Okay, so I've got three surfaces here. Um, they're all minimal surfaces. So they all have zero mean curvature and they all have negative Gaussian curvature. So they're um, hyperbolic. Um, so all of them are periodic in three directions of space. So for example, I could take this little unit here of this surface here and I can repeat it in this direction and up here and then into the page. And obviously I've just cut out a small section of this surface, but the surface is really infinite um, in all three directions of space. Um, so all of these surfaces divide space into two equal channels. Okay, so you can see here that there's a kind of purple colored channel. One side of the surface is colored purple. And so that's my channel here. And then I have a green channel here. Now, if I'm looking at the full periodic surface without cutting it out, um, then actually this green channel here that's apparently on the outside is exactly the same as the purple channel that's on the inside. And that's the case for all of these three surfaces here. Um, so I'm going to um, describe these surfaces by the um, by their, their channel structure. Okay, so the network that defines um, each of the each of these channels and those channels look exactly like this. Okay, so here we have a primitive cubic network. Okay, which I guess is pretty self-explanatory. We have um, degree six vertices, um, and then all, all of the edges and vertices are related by symmetry. Um, we have a degree four network. This is the diamond network. 
Okay, so we have each of the vertices are degree four and all of the edges and vertices are related by symmetry. And then this third net network here is called the SRS network. It's exactly the same structure as these two, except now I have degree three vertices. So I have regular degree three vertices, all of the edges and vertices are related by symmetry. And so these three networks are the um, channel structure of my three different surfaces. Okay, so you can see here that my channels are um, nice um, um, cubes here. Um, we've got a diamond structure here, and then we've got an SRS structure here. And so these three surfaces, I'm going to call the primitive cubic surface here, um, the diamond minimal surface here, and the gyroid minimal surface here. Okay, so I'm, um, I guess there's these um, surfaces have a lot of use in, in biological systems. Um, and so they're a, a nice, um, they're a nice combination of the natural world and kind of classical differential geometry, where in particular, these two surfaces have been described for a long time. Um, and I like to use them as, as templates for making more complicated things. Okay, so, um, so much like if I took just a cylinder, I could wrap a flat plane over the cylinder. In this case, I can wrap the hyperbolic plane over each of these three surfaces. And that's what I'm showing here. This blue and white tiling on one side and the purple and white tiling on the other side. Um, and then the, the unwrapping of this tiling um, onto the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so here I have the hyperbolic plane in the Poincaré disk model, um, where all of my tiles are exactly the same size. They've just been squashed into this disk here, and um, they're kind of going off to infinity at the boundary here. Okay, so this is my two-dimensional hyperbolic plane with a tiling on it, and I can, I can cut out a piece of that plane, and I can wrap it over these surfaces. So you could see for, um, maybe a... Um, a, a reference point to look at would be, okay, the center here, you could put that maybe onto here, okay, where I've got 12 um, triangles around that point. Um, I go off here to uh, four triangles around a point that could be along here, and then again to 12 triangles and so on, okay? So really, I'm, I'm, I'm really just taking this hyperbolic plane and I'm wrapping it over the surfaces. Um, and so the nice thing about um, two-dimensional surfaces is that um, tilings and, and various things are far more easy to describe um, than in three dimensions. So there's a rather large project going on um, in Canberra in Australia um, through um, Stu Ramsden, Vanessa Robbins and Stephen Hyde, who was talking yesterday evening um, or afternoon, I guess it is there, um, called the EpiNet project. And that's looking at um, so Euclidean patterns from non-Euclidean tilings. Okay, so essentially here, they're looking at um, putting um, simple tilings of the hyperbolic plane, like what you see here. So here are our tile boundaries. We're tiling by hexagons, and there's four hexagons around each vertex. And then taking a tiling like this and wrapping it over a minimal surface. So in this case, the primitive cubic minimal surface. So you can see here is my central point, and then my hexagon is sitting around here, um, and with some um, um, paying a bit of attention to um, group theory and symmetry, um, you can make sure that that all of the um, that these tilings kind of work out once you've wrapped them over the surface. Okay, so we have a, a tiling here, a hyperbolic tiling. We've wrapped it over um, the primitive cubic minimal surface here. And if we now take those tile boundaries um, as trajectories in space, so we forget about the surface and we're just left with those tile boundaries, we have a network in space. Okay, so and so in this case, we have a, a simple tiling by hexagons on the piece, the primitive cubic minimal surface, and we end up with a framework that is actually the sodalite network, so a zeolite network um, that I believe some other speakers from today um, work on sometimes. Um, and this is this is what sodalite looks like here, this blue stone. Okay, and so the the idea is that. Um, um, this set of uh, kind of stepping through and enumerating these two dimensional tilings um, in a rigorous way, um, which can be done, um, can lead to a um, um, exploration of, of three dimensional structure. Okay. Um, so as a, as a kind of side branch of this, um, one can look at um, 
changing these networks. So instead of looking at a tiling in the hyperbolic plane, looking at um, essentially like a line packing. So this would be tile, tiling by infinite tiles or ribbon tiles. Um, and so here my, my tile boundaries are just um, infinite geodesics, okay? So here we have three of them going around here and then we have them here. And because the hyperbolic plane um, is so curved, we're able to essentially pack these lines a little bit like parallel lines. Okay, and so here are two different um, tilings um, or geodesic packings in the hyperbolic plane. And I can wrap these um, tilings over, in this case, the, the gyroid minimal surface. Okay, so here I have one unit cell of the gyroid. And you can see that these lines here are wrapping to these curves on the surface here. Okay, so this is my reference point from here in the middle. Um, and then I kind of move out from there and I've got these three lines going around there and then they kind of wrap around the surface in an interesting way. Okay, so if I do the same process again and I take this, this um, curve now as just a trajectory in three-dimensional space, so I forget about my surface and I just look at the set of curves, um, then I get this nice structure here. Okay, so it's a, a rod packing, so the cylinder packing that we saw before, um, but this time by, by helical cylinders. Okay, um, and if we do this packing here, so this is a slightly different tiling, but also on the gyroid minimal surface, it gives us a different um, um, packing here. So also a rod packing and also from um, um, with helical filaments. Okay, and if we straighten those filaments, then we end up with these two rod packings so that we saw at the, at the start. So this one here, um, I'm going to call um, beta manganese rod packing. I could also call it um, pi plus. Um, and this one here is called the sigma plus rod packing. Okay, so these are well described by Mike O'Keefe um, and the reference on the first page. Okay, so now I have um, some very high symmetric, uh, high symmetry um, line packings in the hyperbolic plane. They're giving me these really nice um, high symmetry cubic rod packings in three dimensional space. Okay, um, and so just for some, some other, a little bit more variety. Um, so also here, so this is the same um, um, hyperbolic line packing that we had just before. If I um, wrap that onto the D minimal surface, so the diamond minimal surface, so I have just one unit cell of that here. You can see that in this particular case, um, these geodesics are, are along the, the straight lines of the, of the D minimal surface. Okay, and the packing that I get is this um, rod packing here that was also on the on the first page. So this one I could call pi star rod packing. Okay, oh, and I and there was also an extra one there. Um, oh no, I've gone the wrong way. I get him. Um, and then this um, second hyperbolic tiling on the p minimal surface, um, and then we have this um, rod packing here. So in this case, this is the the omega plus rod packing, also described by Mike O'Keefe. Okay, so um, yeah, the moral of the story here is that um, we can take these simple hyperbolic tilings and get um, relatively simple um, high symmetry um, cubic rod packings. Now in the hyperbolic plane, um, there's a bit more flexibility in how we can um, do these or how we can make these um, line packings. And in particular, I guess this, this is kind of like if I have a, um, a straight line on the plane, and then I, I wrap it up onto a cylinder, then I get a helix on the cylinder. And if I vary the pitch of my original line, okay, so play around with A over B, so I have a, a various different lines, then I'm going to get various different um, helical pitches of my, of my line on the cylinder. And that's essentially what I'm doing here. Um, if you look at the symmetry and the, the kind of pattern in the symmetry, um, it's really the same thing, but there's a whole lot more flexibility in how we can um, change the pitch of the line um, in the hyperbolic plane. And so here are just some examples of changing the pitch. Essentially, we have the same symmetry and we're changing the pitch of this line um, to give us um, essentially a higher pitch and a, and a more dense packing of those lines. And we can wrap all of these different structures onto the minimal surfaces as well. Okay, so we have this huge breadth of, of a combinatoric explosion of different structures that we can make through this method of um, describing 2D hyperbolic tilings and then um, wrapping them onto minimal surfaces in order to make three-dimensional structure. 
And so what do we end up with from these type of um, more um, woven lines, you might say, is then a packing of curvilinear um, um, rods in space, okay? So our, our lines are no longer straight. They're now curved around each other and they're kind of tangled in space really. Um, so here are just some examples of some kind of nice symmetric um, um, line packings that we've made on, um, on the minimal surfaces. So these are all periodic in three directions of space. Um, and so the question is a little bit, okay, how can we um, characterize these? How can we quantify them? How can we think about them as um, materials? Um, and that's what I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about today. Okay, so one approach um, that I've looked into is um, looking at rope length minimizers. I guess yesterday in Sabetta's talk, um, we heard a little bit about um, energy minimizing geometry and ideal knots and, and all of that type of thing. So it's really the, the same idea is looking at, um, so essentially if we have a knot, so okay, so here are four different knots. What we can do is we can tie the knot out of um, a rope of a given thickness um, and then measure, uh, I guess, minimize the amount of rope that we need um, per thickness. Okay, and then once we've minimized, we can use that, um, that shape as a canonical representative of our knot. Okay, so it's giving a geometry or a canonical geometry um, to the, to the um, yeah, more abstract topology of the knot. Um, so that's a, 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 something that's well studied in the case of knots, both computationally and also analytically. Um, and um, yeah, I've extended this idea to look at periodic structures. Okay, so now we're looking at rod packings um, inside a periodic unit cell, and we're minimizing the, the length of the filaments inside the unit cell um, divided by the radius or divided by the diameter per unit cell. Okay, so within a unit cell, we're then minimizing this length divided by diameter. Okay, and these are two of the types of structures that I um, that come out of this. So I should say that this is um, at the moment just computational um, and there's all kinds of um, um, questions in there about how unique are the configurations? Is there really a unique energy minimizer? Um, can you computationally even find it? Um, but um, I guess at the moment we're really looking at the kind of qualitative geometry that's coming out of these um, rather than the, I guess, the exact descriptions of the, of the structures. So um, out of this came um, a kind of nice idea. So essentially, if I'm looking at my um, pi plus rod packing from the start that we've talked about, or the, the beta manganese rod packing, um, naively, one would expect that the length per diameter per unit cell, okay, should be minimized when the filaments are pulled straight. So you would assume that straight trajectory is kind of the best that you could get. Um, but for some particular packings, which include this one, there's a kind of curious process that if we allow the filaments to bend around each other, curve around each other, um, then we can reduce the size of the unit cell significantly. Okay, and so we can go essentially from here to a configuration like this. Okay, so by allowing, say, this purple one to bend up around here and the blue one to bend down and around, I can really compact the unit cell or equivalently inflate um, the diameter of my of my tube, and so I end up getting a, a lower, um, a less length per unit cell um, than if I had the straight the straight rods here, which is kind of curious. And so, um, yeah, the idea is that this is a kind of auxetic like um, behavior, um, but it's kind of different as well. Um, and um, yeah, it was a kind of nice. Um, kind of mechanical idea that just came out of looking at um, geometric embeddings of these, of these rod packings. So a particular rod packing had this property. Um, so the sigma plus rod packing that I showed at the start, um, which you can see here is made out of helical fibers. Um, now it turns out that this rod packing is the arrangement of keratin intermediate filaments in mammalian skin. So including your skin. Um, so um, this is in the dead skin cells in your outer layer of skin. So inside the skin cells is essentially made up of 
um, a keratin matrix um, filled with water and a few other um, bits and pieces in there. And so, um, yeah, so these are the keratin intermediate filament bundles. So it's essentially filament bundles are then aligning along these rod axes in space. And this um, kind of curious dilatant um, 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 property that I showed in the previous slide um, is exactly what allows a kind of really nice um, expansion of the, of the structure, a bit like a sponge soaking up water and, and compacting down in a kind of unique pathway back down to the compacted version. And I'll just show you the, the um, structure here. This is using some physical modeling um, of the salvation free energy of the system and how it um, should behave. So you can see that the, the fibers, so you've got, you have helical fibers along the rod directions and as they straighten, um, they kind of lever off each other to get an expansion of the material. So yeah, this was a kind of nice physical property coming out of these um, rod packings or these ideal rod packings um, when they become helical. So that brings me down to um, a little more of the point of my talk. Sorry, I'll just take a break. So um, this is the um, beta manganese rod packing that I showed at the start. And you can see it here squished down to its more helical version where you get a, a more compact object. Okay, so essentially I'm just making these, these fibers helical and you can see when they're helical that I can squash the material down essentially. So you can imagine these as, as really three periodic materials. Um, I'm just cutting out a small section. Okay, so this is the kind of squashing process or the expansion process back to um, straight rods here. Okay, so I'm gonna imagine this now um, as a tensegrity structure. So bear with me for a minute. Okay, so um, I guess probably everybody here is mostly familiar with the tensegrity structure, but for those who aren't, um, I'll give a very short introduction. Um, so I guess they originated in architectural work um, from Kenneth Nelson and Buckminster Fuller. Um, so I like this um, beautiful object here. Um, and they use a, a combination of tension and compression forces um, to give a, a stable structure in space. Um, I guess this um, child's toy here is also a good one. I also have one of those, but it's um, sitting in my office at the moment. So I, um, yeah, I don't have it here to show. But essentially you have these, these um, um, rigid rods um, joined by elastic elements. And the rigid rods are under compression and the elastic elements are under tension. Okay, and these kind of the combination of, of forces hold the structure together. Um, yeah, so a, a tensegrity can be described by a set of vertices, which fulfills simple distance constraints. So we have um, struts prescribed that the vertices can never be closer than a given distance, um, but can be arbitrarily far apart. Um, so that's our kind of rigid rods, you might call them. Um, vertices connected by a cable, so these are our, our elastic elements, um, can be as close together as desired, but not farther apart um, than the length of the cable. And um, an interesting parallel could be made to sphere packings, um, where the centers of spheres can never be closer than twice the radius. Okay, so this is essentially the struts would be then twice the radius. Um, and that kind of gives you a mechanical model of your sphere packing. Um, and so this is kind of a well-known idea. Um, so um, I want to extend that idea to um, a cylinder packing instead of a sphere packing. Okay, so um, the contacts between cylinders will now be represented by rigid incompressible bars. And these connect the central axes of the cylinders and they'll have length um, twice the filament radius. Okay, so essentially wherever I have a contact between my, my rods, I put in a bar that is two radius in length. Okay, so let's say from the center of this one to the center of this one. Okay, so I go one radius here, two radi radii there. Um, and I put in a, a, a bar that kind of represents the fact that my, my, my cylinders have a radius and are in contact. So they can't get any closer. Their, their centers can't get any closer. Okay, so at each of the contacts between the filaments, I put in a rigid bar. And then I'm going to put in um, thin elastic struts along the central axes of my cylinders. Okay, so essentially I'm just turning my cylinders into an elastic. Okay, and um, 
and then that's kind of pin, pinned together by all of the um, all of the the struts representing the um, radii. Okay, and so essentially, I get something like this. Um, so I don't know how difficult this is to see because I've looked at this so many times that um, that it's obvious for me. But let me talk you through it a little bit. Okay, so we have a, a periodic unit cell here. Okay, so the black cube is our periodic unit cell. That's just for visualization. So I have elastic elements in yellow, blue, and purple. Okay, so these are al along my rods. Okay, so this is actually, I haven't taken the straight rod version, I've taken a helical rod version. Okay, so it's not exactly the, the object that I had in the previous slide. Okay, and so I, I'm, I've turned my helical rod into this kind of thin helical elastic thing here. And then I've represented, so my black elements are my rigid rods. Okay, so they're representing all of the contacts between, um, between my rods, my original rods in the rod packing. Okay, so you can see that I'm going here from the center of the yellow rod to the center of the purple rod. Okay, and then yeah, it all kind of combines into this, into this structure here. Yeah, so it's, it's embedded in a triply periodic unit cell. It's, it's cubic. Um, and it has 24 vertices and 36, 36 edges inside the cubic unit cell. Um, so all of my vertices are of degree three. Okay, and so essentially the they have they only you only ever have one contact on the on the rod, which means that you have you have an elastic going through, and then you have one contact one contact so one rod coming out of that elastic. And all of the degree three vertices have the kind of um, reentrant geometry of the um, reentrant honeycomb. So the, the I guess essentially a, vert, a vertex like this with a rod coming into it. Yeah, so we can make this structure for each of our different um, kind of levels of, um, of, of density of our, of our rod packing. Okay, so at each, at each um, level of compaction, we can then expand it out, expand it out, and, meet, and at each point, we can make a, um, a tensegrity structure, okay? So what's, I guess, what's curious about this tensegrity structure is that the um, elastic elements are extending over the periodic boundaries. Um, and so there's this kind of certain tension that's involved in, in keeping this structure coherent, Okay, so um, I guess we have, so we've constructed this, this tensegrity and our first task is to find an equilibrium configuration of it. Okay, so for any of these tensegrity structures, um, we can calculate the equilibrium configuration. So we wanna place springs along each of the elastic cables. Um, so these will each have an energy proportional to the square of their length. Um, if we minimize this collectively while maintaining all of the length conditions of the tensegrity, um, then the equilibrium configuration can be found. Um, so the periodicity of the structure for um, a fixed unit cell size um, is incorporated through additional constraints, keeping vertices related to copies of themselves um, by periodicity vectors. Okay, so we can write down all of the constraints um, between the vertices in this um, periodic unit cell. Okay, so in order to do this, um, we um, described this, the tensegrity or the spring energy using the discrete Dirichlet energy on the vertex set of the unit cell. Um, so I'm not gonna go into details now, but I can, um, if anybody's interested, I can send you something about that. Um, so the system is in equilibrium if the forces and momenta um, at each of the vertex vertices are zero. Um, and if we also take the bars as having fixed lengths, okay, so these bars having fixed lengths, then we can define an optimization problem on this in order to minimize the energy and find an equilibrium configuration. Um, so through this, through this project, I'm, I'm putting this in just because I think it might be interesting for some people um, who are listening. Um, so we started, I guess we, we analyze this structure in lots of different perspectives from lot, using as many um, different tools from numerical algebraic geometry um, as possible. Um, and 
I guess every time we did, we found that our system was just way too big and way too complicated for anything that's out there. Um, and so um, that's kind of sparked off some new directions. So that's why I'm including, I'm including this information. Um, so we tried to use semi-definite programming. So in particular, Glopti Poly, um, but it was just way too computationally um, intensive um, to be able to solve the problem for this structure. And in the end, we just used um, a kind of standard um, sequential least squares programming from SciPy, um, which will give us a local minima, but um, we can't really guarantee a global optimization. But I think for now, that's kind of sufficient. Well, I guess that's the only thing we could do. So um, that's where we got to. Right, so we have a, um, a, an equilibrium configuration. And actually, we found that this symmetric um, starting configuration was in equilibrium already. So it was in a, at least a local energy um, minima. And um, what we then did is um, looked at a quasi-static extension and compression of the structure. Okay, so we have our structure in equilibrium. We do a very small um, um, step. So essentially, we, our deformation is changing the um, periodicity in the x direction. Okay, so we make our periodicity ever so slightly larger. And then we let us, our um, structure equilibrate again. And then we continue doing that um, so that we essentially have a, a smooth transition through a deformation. I guess there's no dynamics involved. We're just looking at um, a smooth um, transformation between equilibrium configurations. Okay, so we, we do a very small, a very small step. Um, and our periodic boundary conditions in the um, y and z directions we leave um, to be optimized by the um, by the by the program. Okay, so they're free variables. Okay, so we aren't restricted to keep those that periodicity in the in the y and z. Um, those those dimensions can also change um, depending on um, where the structure wants to find an equilibrium. Okay, so that's our kind of um, experimental setup. So what we found um, is that when we um, Okay, so let me just take you through this plot here. Um, this axis here is um, a bit of a mystery. Um, it's actually, we're just doing an extension cycle up until about here where this peak is, and then we're compressing, and then we're extending and compressing over again. Okay, so we're cycling through an extension and a compression and an extension and a compression. Okay, so what happens is, um, and, and what I'm plotting here is the, um, the periodicity in the y and z directions. Okay, so we're starting at, um, at edge length one, so a cube with edge length one, and we're increasing our, um, our x periodicity. And what we're finding is we get um, a bit of an anomaly here at the start, and then the periodicities of um, in the y and z directions also increase. And then once we start um, decreasing our, um, oh, oops, lost. Um, when we start then compressing again or kind of releasing the tension and, and compressing, um, we then get a decrease in the, the, um, in the, the size in the, the Y and Z directions. And then we go into this kind of nice phase where it's quite well behaved. Um, so what's the, I guess, what, what here is interesting, um, there's a kind of strange region at the start here where it's quite poorly behaved. Um, and essentially what's happening here is there's a symmetry breaking of the, of the structure. So as we as we start to pull, we get a kind of large, lots of large symmetry events um, where it goes to a far more random structure. And then after a certain point, once that's all kind of sort of itself out, um, we start to get an expansion in the opposite directions um, as we expand. And as we then contract those two opposite directions contract in again, and we get into a nice stable, um, nice stable phase. So essentially our structures look something like this. Okay, so here's our starting configuration. You can see the nice symmetry of the, of the helical um, elastic fibers and the, the black rods, the black incomp incompressible rods. And so once we do an extension in the X direction, we get something like this. Okay, so now our kind of nice helices are no longer so nice. Um, and they're, um, so we have a, yeah, a lot of symmetry breaking within there. And um, in general, we don't get a very large expansion in the, other, in the opposite direction, okay? So this would still be in this phase just here. I think that that second one is somewhere around here. 
And then in the third one here, um, you can see that we get quite a large expansion um, in the, well, at least the Y direction. And you can trust me that it's also in the Z direction. Um, so as we further expand along the X direction here. So if we um, look at the instantaneous Poisson's ratio of this structure, um, so here is our, our same frame number as before. Okay, so we're going essentially up to an expansion. Um, where are we? So our expansion was, oh, I don't have a, um, okay, so our expansion is probably to about here and then a contraction and then an expansion and a contraction again. You can see that our Poisson's ratio um, to start with is slightly positive. And then once things start sorting themselves out again, it drops down to very negative. Okay, so in the um, Z direction here, we have a Poisson's ratio of below minus one. Oh yeah, is there a question there? Yeah, what's the Poisson ratio? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, so this is essentially, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, I guess it's related to the um, to those op those opposite directions. Okay, so if I'm expanding in one direction, okay, it's saying how am I how am I behaving in the opposite directions? So if I'm shrinking, so I guess a typical material um, when you stretch it would shrink. And this would have a pos positive Poisson's ratio, and if I expand in the opposite directions in those perpendicular directions, then I have a negative Poisson's ratio. Um, just to give you, um, that's I guess that's the kind of um, feeling concept, um, but I guess you can define it more, more rigorously than that. And what this is saying is that it's instantaneous, so we're really looking at each point, you know, at each time step from the time step before, um, is it, how is it changing from the time step before, rather than over a kind of large, large deformation. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so we get a very, um, quite negative Poisson's ratio, so about minus 1.1, in the, the Z direction and about um, minus 0 0.75 in the Y direction. Um, so our tensegrity network is definitely auxetic. Oh. Um, so we've looked at some um, finite element modeling of this. Um, so this is um, um, with Marcelo Diaz, who's now in um, Edinburgh. And so he's been using um, some finite element modeling. So in particular, COMSOL multi-physics and looking at um, beam elements. And um, yeah, so essentially where, um, well, okay. So we have a, a rather exact um, mathematical def um, deformation that we can do with these um, you know, points with, a, with, with restrictions on them. So we, we can um, encode our, our um, incompressible bars and our elastic elements, but these are really existing on, on um, points and lines. Um, so the idea is how do we extend that to an actual material? Um, and so in this case, we're modeling um, it, looking at the cross-sectional areas of the, of the different rods. So essentially we have a very thick rod for our, um, for our incompressible bars um, so that it's almost incompressible. And then we have thinner, thinner elements for our um, elastic elements. Um, yeah, and so we're looking at just def deforming. Um, in this case, it's not periodic anymore. We just have a fixed piece. Um, and um, yeah, you can see, so this is stretching upwards is our direction of stretching here. And you can see, I guess it's only a very small stretch, but you can just see the starts of a, um, of an expansion um, in this perpendicular direction here. If we go to the next one here. Um, so in this case, we're going to be stretching into the page or kind of out of the page towards us. Okay, so we can look at how things work then in the um, perpendicular directions here. And so you can see there that once we start stretching into out towards us, we get expansions in the opposite two directions there. And um, I guess these are very preliminary results, um, but in this case, we find that the Poisson's ratio is, is also negative, not to the same extent as um, our idealized system that we were working with, um, but we still get pretty good results then. Um, so I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second, just so that I can show you. Oh, oh now I've lost Zoom. Oh yeah, there. Um, just to show you this model here as well. I don't know how, how well this is going to work and how well you can see it. Um, but sorry, here is 
um, a 3D printed version of our structure. So in this case, I haven't differentiated between my incompressible rods and my elastic elements at all. I've just kind of just done a brute um, print it um, in a, in a um, slightly elastic material. Um, and you can see already actually, so let's hold it up here, um, that we get quite a nice um, auxetic behavior when we stretch it here and also around here as well. Which is quite nice. So I guess the, um, um, yeah, what's the take home message from that? It's more that, um, so my incompressible bars here are certainly able to bend, um, which isn't ideal, um, which, um, yeah, clearly um, doesn't mimic our mathematical system, but it's saying that the, the auxetic behavior and the kind of nice behavior, behavior that we see in the, in the idealized system or our theoretical system can carry, can carry over to a real system in a pretty simple way, even if it's not to the same extent. Um, sorry, I'll just share my screen again, just for the last few slides. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the end of our structure. And um, I guess there were some nice questions that came up in the process of doing this, this um, project. And the first one was, um, how can we get um, better numerical algebraic geometry um, um, programs or, or ways of thinking about these structures that are able to deal with, um, well, I guess, I don't think that this structure is so complicated for a three-dimensional structure. Um, and yet it was really way, way, way beyond anything that was out there. Um, and this is a nice project that um, Alex Heaton is working on. Um, and he's a, a postdoc in the, um, at the Fields Institute this semester in, um, together with this special semester. Um, and he's come up with some really nice things. So if you're interested in that direction, you should talk to Alex. Um, and um, I guess my other point is that this one particular um, rod packing or helical rod packing that I um, made into an um, into the tensegrity structure is actually just one of many. So we have all kinds of different um, rod packings. Um, so such as this one here, which was also in the skin structure, um, but there's also really infinitely many structures like this um, that we can make that should have this same property. Um, it seems that this special property is related to it being chiral. Um, but exactly why that's the case isn't totally clear yet. Um, but yeah, so this is a kind of nice design technique going from cylinder packings um, to being able to um, generate really nice, um, highly symmetric um, materials with some really nice properties. Yeah, cool. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, I should, um, this, a lot of this work was done by Matthias Oster in his master's thesis at the TU Berlin um, and um, in collaboration with Timo de Wolf, who's now at TU Braunschweig and Marcelo Diaz, who's now in Edinburgh. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mif. That was a fascinating talk, connecting so many things together. Wonderful. So uh, let's see, uh, questions from the audience. Herbert. Uh, it was a beautiful talk. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have a question. Uh, you answered pretty much all of them. Cool. <laughs> what told us that you don't have an answer? Yeah, yeah true, true. I get, yeah, true. Uh, maybe one question I can ask. Um, uh, the, the first minimal surface that you show, that's the Schwartz surface, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, Many years ago, I created something similar to Schwartz surface by quadratic surfaces, just spheres and hyperboloids of mm -hmm. uh, revolution. And it also, it looks the same, so I cannot tell the difference. And it also is inside-outside symmetric, just mm -hmm. like a Schwartz surface. And ever since, I wonder somehow how come this is possible? And or maybe my question could be like, the Schwartz surface, does it have a simpler geomet um, algebraic description? Uh, 
I assume it cannot be described by patches of bounded polynomial degree. I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, th I think I know the, the kind of approximation that you're talking about. Um, it's essentially a kind of, well, oh no, oh, maybe it's different. I know that there's a nodal approximation of the surfaces um, where you can put in a bunch of um, cosines and sines and you can get essentially something like the primitive cubic, but maybe the, the construction you're talking about is slightly different. No, I think it's I think it's quite different. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, me, if, uh, if I may intervene here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the minimal surfaces were just the starting point. You could have other surfaces with uh, similar topology, let's say, with similar shape but slightly deformed. So maybe what Herbert is talking about, it's something that is very close to the Schwartz surface. It's yeah, not, true. It true. Minimal surface. It's a surface with essentially very close, very close by an approximation. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's just that, not not minimizing anymore. Yeah, um, but the rest of the talk does not use anything about the minimality. It's just essentially the uh, you are using the channels and how they uh, the connectivity. You are are you using anywhere the minimality? The no, not at all. Yeah. Okay. Not at all. Mm. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, Sasha. Sasha. Hey, Sasha. Hi. <laughs> Great talk. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about the uh, mechanical behavior overall. I mean, this is a cubic system, and so you should have something like three moduli or other, you know, con continuum uh, 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 parameters that describe the mechanical behavior. You showed that you get two different Poisson's ratios for the two perpendicular directions. Uh, should you be able to infer Poisson's ratio in any direction from those? If you were to pull in an arbitrary direction and, and you know, find out I where you get the maximum or whether you get, right? Yeah, true. I don't know. And I'm, it might not, oh, well, it, it could be that you're restricted to the X, Y, and Z directions. With the with the extension, if I just show my my model here, mm -hmm. um, so when I, when I pull, I have to be pulling on the elastic elements, right? And so the elastic elements are running along my along my x, y, and z directions. Mm -hmm. So if I pull on some kind of other part, it doesn't really work so well. Uh -huh. And so I'm I'm I don't really know how it's going to work when I when I pull in in non-standard directions and how how it really works completely as a three-dimensional material i don't know we're really we're really restricted to the to just the to just those three directions um but it's a it's a nice question about how it all really plays out as a full as a full three-dimensional material and how right. it strikes tensor looks really. I, I don't think know. There's some, I think there's some theory on it, but, but I'm not sure that everything is known about how this works. So um. Yeah, okay, okay. You know, interesting. I guess this is a very, very new project that um, I'm completely out of my depth in. So um, if there's no nice ideas, let's right. talk. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Hyde has a question. Oh, hi, Mitch. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I've got a couple of com just a couple of questions and a quick comment first, maybe on what Herbert was saying. I think that if you have inside-outside symmetry, that just means that the surface average of the mean curvature is zero. It doesn't mean it's point-wise zero everywhere. It just means it average out, averages out to zero. So I think that's mathematically. The condition so it could be algebraic in that case but it won't be minimal but myth i was fascinated by that original deformation phase where it has positive plus on the ratio what what's going on there yeah i think so i think that it's um what's happening is we're going from this structure here to this structure here and there's just a whole bunch of i think it's mainly these so all of our incompressible rods are lined up along X, Y, and Z. And they um, kind of, they, they randomly, um, 
yeah, they randomly realign themselves. Yeah, they're, they're sort of random. fighting each other, aren't they? So exactly, exactly. If, if if they could all work in the, if they could all cooperate, it would have yep. negative Poisson's ratio immediately, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um. So with the work with Marcelo, um, what we did was we started from the so. What, not what I showed, but what we did for some other experiments was starting from the um, symmetric version. And when we made the, um, what was it? When we made the material very, very stiff and started to, um, to extend, um, we got instantly um, negative Poisson's rate. So we got a better negative Poisson's ratio than if it was really um, elastic, which was a bit opposite what we thought. And I think that that shows that the, the really stiff material isn't allowing it to break symmetry at all. And so, and so, and, and so it becomes directly negative Poisson's ratio. Whereas when it's really elastic, it needs to kind of sort itself out a little bit. And then once it gets to a particular point, then it starts to expand. So that's sort of related to my other question which was your model was really interesting I was surprised by that that the the simple homogeneous you know mechanical properties you didn't need the tensegrity in that sense yeah to, true. The approximation right so yeah. how how floppy can you make it and you're still going to get that do you know what I mean like how elastic could you make all those how much could they could the cables and the struts converge to the same thing yeah true so um so I, th I think that you need to keep some distance between yeah. uh, like a, kind of along, along the struts. And I think that's really the, the thing that's making it expand is the, the kind of interaction of those hard bits kind of being, being you know, when I, when I pull in in the opposite direction, these kind of move up like this. And, and, and that movement is really what's driving it. Um, I guess in my, in my kind of material here, it's not very elastic. So it can bend, but it can't really stretch very well. Um, and so what I've done is instead of, so my, my kind of straight lines here, I've actually made them curved so that this is just helical. So I've used a kind of perfectly helical. So there's a bit of slack there where it can just bend to be slightly longer. Yeah, yeah. So I've cheated a little bit there. Um, and then it's, it's kind of stiff enough that the, that the compressive, compressive elements don't um, don't compress that much. They bend a little bit, but not too much. But you did, so you don't need any elasticity. I mean, you need some elasticity in there somewhere. Yeah, right? true. You do, and um, it it should work way better if if I could get better elasticity. We've just we've yeah we've been trying to print. Well, it that's my question though. That if you make it really elastic, I mean, you need don't you need to distinguish <laughs> between stretch, compression, and tension? So. You, you see what I mean? You can't make everything. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, if you could differentiate two different materials, um, so as in print the, the struts in a different material to the, to the elastic elements, then I think that you should get a way better behaviour. So that's what you think. You do need that to amplify the augs, augs, yeah, uh, yeah. plus on pressure. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Yeah, I think that you would get a way better behaviour if you could... Um, yeah, printed in two materials, but we just haven't, it just hasn't worked. Thanks, really interesting talk. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, I, I have just a, a brief uh, question observation. So in your design at some point, you had vertices of degree three and they were pointed, what, uh, what the literature calls, what the materials literature refers to the reentrant part. But mm -hmm. you, are now, you are now in 3D and uh, degree three means that if you want to have some equilibrium there, those uh, three have to be in a plane. Uh, is this um, um, visible somehow in the design or in some properties that come up later, the planarity of those um, connections at one vertex, because this happens everywhere, right? So all of your vertices are degree three, if I understood correctly. Yeah, true. So I think that by the design process, they are planar. Um, they should be maintained. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that they are maintained as planar. 
Okay. Um, so actually, these these degree three. So we originally looked at rigidity of this of this structure, and it's completely floppy. It's really nowhere near. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think about in the in the limit when you stretch the material so that those. So if I, where am I? If I'm really back at this limit, okay, so my elastic fiber, well, I guess they aren't elastic anymore. I just essentially have, have like straight rods that then have rods coming out of them. Um, I'd be really interested to know, to know if this structure is actually rigid or, well, I don't really know which definition of rigidity I should be using there, but it seems like it should be somehow constrained in space. Um, and, and it's very interesting because it's a completely under constrained system. And so, um, I, yeah, I think that there's there's something interesting there to explore this. Well, I guess we, we tried looking into it um, with homotopy continuation and which are real solutions and which are um, complex solutions. And it was just way too complex. But I, I hope with Alex's work that um, we can work a little bit more towards this. But these, yeah, I, these degree three vertices in, in 3D are really so under constrained. Yes. Um, yeah. But they, there's something interesting about them. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a feeling. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, then I, I have a follow up question. So, in uh, answering one of the previous questions, you referred to the fact that, in fact, the material that you used, uh, when you made it uh, more rigid, actually, the behavior was more strikingly uh, oxetic than when they were floppy. So that is very interesting. So it, uh, if you make them more rigid, you are basically converging towards the bar and joint version that uh, Ciprian and the theory that we are developing. And I was wondering now, so that's also related to your measurements of the Poisson's ratio in, in uh, different directions. So, um, our definition is not dependent on a particular direction. And mm -hmm. as I'm looking at your system is very symmetric. So if you are getting that behavior in one direction, if your material is stiff enough, then I would anticipate that perhaps uh, it, it might satisfy our definition of uh, oxeticity, which is, as I said, it's independent of a, a direction and the perpendicular one. So it's more in terms of the dilational aspect. So I'm curious because you have all the ingredients there. You have the, uh, you have the uh, framework, you, you constructed it. And so I would be very curious whether this will uh, happen. So if you have the, the, let's say the quotient graph of that or anything that we can turn into, we have tools to verify that property. Yeah, it's super, no, that would be really interesting. Yeah, mm. it is intriguing that you had the, you observed the, uh, the behavior in at least, well, the classical uh, direction. So the, the experimental measurement was uh, validated with what the material scientists are using. Mm -hmm. so it would mm -hmm. be very nice to check that. Yeah, absolutely. No, that'd be really interesting. We should definitely talk. Yes, we should talk because we, we have code for checking that. So it's just that uh, is getting the, extracting the relevant data of, out, of your, um, mm -hmm. out of your framework, essentially, out of your graph. Yeah, super. Now that's really cool. Well, mm. it was a fascinating talk and uh, bringing together so many uh, so many topics and, uh, and beautiful pictures. I, I'm speechless. It was fantastic. Um, let's see if there are no other questions. So then people who want to, uh, yeah, Herbert is still having questions. I mean, people who want to leave can leave and we can continue here. I don't <laughs> feel inclined to stop the conversation. It's so interesting. Yes, Herbert. I thought that might be an opening for a, a, a simple question, clearing up a confusion. Um, if I understand your uh, integrity is symmetric, the one way where you stretched in X and Y and Z. So why was the Poisson ratio different in Y and in Z? Yeah, true. So when I, oh, sorry, this is going to take me forever to go through. But when I, sorry, two seconds, essentially with the symmetry breaking at the start, um, yeah, so when I go from this symmetric version to this version here, I lose my cubic symmetry. So I've lost all of those kind of symmetry, symmetries between like the purple element and the blue element and the yellow element. 
And so I, my structure is no longer symmetric um, between the, the Y and the Z direction. Mm. And so I get a differentiation. So actually this is something that also when I, so when we make it more stiff and it um, stays more symmetric when it, when it expands, um, we get that the two um, Poisson's ratios of, of in the Y and the Z come closer together as it becomes more stiff. So it stays more cubic um, as you make it more stiff. Why didn't you bring uh, build a larger fragment? So you basically have a what a one by one by one, just the unit cell or a, a small um, repetition? Um, was that for, for this or yeah. um, cost? <laughs> Oh yes, of I course. Guess, yes, yes, yes. I, I guess um. So the, yeah, I guess this was just made on 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 the internet in the on a kind of mail order um, um printing, and to be honest, I wasn't sure that it was going to work. Um, I to be honest, I thought that I would have to get something to put onto the in incompressible rods. I had imagined like that I'd have to pull out some nail polish and paint them on or something like that to make them a bit stiffer. Um, but actually, it just worked. So it was more just a test run. I guess I just got this a week ago. It's more just testing out how how it works and if if, if I can just do the simplest thing and if it if it'll come out like that and it, and it did, which is nice. Okay. Yeah. It it tends to be uh, dependent on the size of uh, of the fragment that you build. So. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A little bit of experiment. So because of course the periodicity is. Um, you are basically working with a, fra a tiny fragment. You are working with a finite uh, framework. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller you have, the more closer to the finite predicted behavior you would be. And so indeed you are breaking the symmetries when you are, you are, you are it's no longer symmetric when you have the small fragment, I understand. But if you make a larger ones, so it will be closer to the internal symmetries will be uh, closer to the, the behavior would be closer to the properties that would be predicted by the symmetries. Yeah, yeah true. No, I see your point. I see your point. Yeah, no, we, we, we ran, uh, we built some of these um, frameworks with, uh, with the help of a, a colleague who is doing 3D printing. And uh, I think he went up to seven by seven by seven so that we could get something uh, that uh, the oxeticity would be observed uh, in these experiments. But it's amazing that you got it very quickly and uh, with, uh, with such a small fragment, with such a small... Uh, yeah, yeah, true. So I think this one's just two by two by two. Yes. Right? So not very many at all. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And do I understand you right that the symmetry breaking that happens when you expand on X is random? Yes. Well, so well, I think... It could have been the other way around with X and Y. Yes, definitely, definitely. If you have a larger, larger structure, then it might be. It, it might the randomness might kind of cancel each other out and be isotropic. I Maybe, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know it could be, know. could be. Okay. Hmm. And it could be that in a larger structure, you get a longer messy period as well because you've got more conflict before it can cooperate you've got yeah, more yeah, true. for it to be messy mm -hmm. so you could have a longer positive Poisson ratio before it if it ever i mean in the infinite case it may never settle down to just comment on what Ileana was saying there's a problem there yeah true because mm -hmm. you've got all these sources of frustration right and you're increasing the number of degrees of freedom as you increase the number of unit cells yes yeah so you could settle into a really messy regime forever. Yeah. Plus, on top <laughs> on top of it, in order to do the three D printing, you are fixing the boundary in one uh, direction. So it looks like in the the x y planes on the two sides are fixed. That that has a little effect on. Uh, I mean, it's just. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. Not much. Uh, depends on the, I would expect that it will have a, a stronger effect if uh, uh, if your bars are really rigid. Yeah, yeah, true. So the no, definitely. 